Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin a series, another new series uh, entitled Did Yahweh Make Paul Go Mad? This is episode one. And um, I'm basing it on this uh, Isaiah 44 uh, passage of uh, from verses 24 to 25. And uh, so this is what brought it to my mind and made me think about this. So uh, again, let me read this to you. We did this on the passage about Paul saying that Jesus was the creator of the heavens and earth solely and without God, the Father involved in Colossians 1, 15 to 17. And that was in our contradictions of Paul, by Paul of Yahweh. Now we're dealing with, could Paul have been driven mad by God? And we'll see, that happened to Nebuchadnezzar. God uh, d did something there. We'll go into that in a second. So let's just read this passage. Yahweh, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb says, I am Yahweh, who makes all things, who alone stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of the liars and makes diviners mad. Who now, the, All the next three lines are all saying the same thing in different ways. Who makes diviners mad, who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolish. So the mad and the foolish and the backward losing their their mind basically what what they did know as wise men they've gone backward so all of this is saying god can affect your mind and it's a punishment for those he he dis, is displeased for now that doesn't mean you he's making you sin he's literally going to to drive you mad and he can do that and he did that to nebuchadnezzar nebuchadnezzar i never pronounced it right so let's listen to that story uh from the book of daniel all right, so we covered that. So here's, uh, and this is such a parallel to Paul, if you haven't, uh, you'll immediately recognize the problem. Nebu this is a pharmaceutical journal, wrote an opinion article on uh, Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar, and we're going to show you the verses, so it's valid. Nebuchadnezzar was humbled by God for boasting about his achievements, lost his sanity, and lived like an animal for seven years, according to Daniel chapter 4. So I'm just going to read you a couple of the verses, but you can read verses 13 through 27, and you'll see the whole message. But uh, and Nebuchadnezzar says to his people around him, I saw a vision in my head in my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven, and he, the holy watcher, cried, let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. So what the, uh, the, the watchman's interpretation will be given the interpretation of the watchman's statement will be given by Daniel. And this idea of changing his heart from a man's heart to a beast's heart means he's going to go crazy. And that's from God. Okay. So God can do that. He's not doing evil. He is literally punishing you for having uh, done evil. And you'll see. So uh, then, then he goes to Belteshar, which is actually Daniel's Aramaic or Babylonian name. And he's uh, at Demachanezer is going to ask him, uh, it says in verse 18, this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshar, Daniel, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation. But thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. He still doesn't acknowledge Yahweh here. Verse 25, they, and Daniel says what it means is, this particular passage, uh, or verse 16, means that they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and it shall make you eat. And they shall make you eat to eat grass as oxen. Okay. Then verse 27. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel. Now, just to show you, God granted Nebuchadnezzar mercy. Now, unlike Paul, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar <laughs> I can't say it too well, never blasphemed God. So he's so Paul's in a worse situation than Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, but uh, here in verse 27, Daniel saying there is room for repentance. And this is what he says. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to, unto you and break off your sins by righteousness and th thine equities by showing mercy to the poor. If it be, if it may be a lengthening of your tranquility, your peace of mind. So the, he told him what he had to do. He had to, he had to break off your sins by doing righteous deeds. See, there is such a thing. And showing mercy to the poor, which is a good way of atoning or making up for your sin when there's a nonspecific issue here, which is just simply his haughtiness. So how to, how to make up for haughtiness and, and boasting is to give charity to the poor from yourself, from your own revenue. So that's the example where God did this once before. Now I'm going to ask, can I prove to you this is likely what God did to Paul? And you see the same boasting issue is involved.
Now, why would God do this to Paul besides his boasting problems? He's got He's got a bigger problem than just boasting. First Timothy 1.13, Paul says that he was, quote, once a blasphemer, blasphemer, but he says, well, because I did it in ignorance, I was forgiven. That's not how it works. The, bla the Pharisees blasphemed Jesus by saying the miracles he was doing was by Beelzebub. They didn't know that Jesus was doing it by the Holy Spirit. They act, they accused him of something ignorantly, and Jesus told them they had just insult he they had just insulted. Uh, the the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, and therefore they had committed the unpardonable sin. So Paul doesn't even understand the principles of blasphemy is not excused by ignorance of what you were saying. You just cannot do stuff without knowing the context. In Acts 26, 11, testifies in court about his life as a persecutor. And Paul says this, and I punished them often every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. So Paul is saying, I caused Christians to commit the unpardonable sin of blasphemy. And that means what? He is directly responsible for their sin. And you'll say, well, where is that in the Bible? Well, actually, Jesus mentions it in Mark 9, verse 42 to 47. He says a believer, and this is interesting. He says a believer in me has has two choices. And he stops there and he says, but woe to the a believer in me who is sinning has two choices. And he stops there. Jesus says, stops there and he says, but woe to the one who makes the believer in me stumble into sin. That's uh, scandalizo. Because they they would rather have a millstone put around their neck than deal with the wrath of God. So that means that the one who causes a believer and a follower, actually is what it really means, follower of Jesus to fall into sin, it will not only be responsible, but be more responsible for, because they led a person who was trying to follow God, Yahweh, and follow Jesus, and that person led that per, that person into sin. That person will be doubly responsible for it. And that's what Jesus was saying in Mark 9, 42, 47. The believer in him, though, still has a chance to repent. But they have to, do, Jesus says, you have a choice. You can go to heaven maimed or you're going to go to hell whole. So you have to cut off the body parts and snaring you in sin that this other evil person led you into sinning. Or you can go to hell uh, uh, hell whole without repenting. So the, the believer still had a chance. But the person who caused the, the believer to fall in the first place, that person is responsible for that sin by that Christian follower of Christ. Now, Paul did that over and over again with this crime of blasphemy. So he is accessory. He's the principal causer of each thing. So just like we have in uh, American law, or, or actually common law, is anybody who causes you, you know, if I tell you, I put a bullet, I put a gun to your head and I said, shoot and kill and murder this person. I'm, it's the, the person firing the bullet shouldn't do it anyway, right? He should resist and, it's, you know, never kill somebody. But if he, if he did so, the person forcing him to kill this other person is himself responsible for the death and murder of the ultimate person. So Paul is liable for all the blasphemies of all the people he sent to hell with an unpardonable sin. How is he going to atone for that? There is no atonement. The law says that right in the, the Ten Commandments. It's God says, I will never forgive the person who commits blasphemy, who what? Desolates my name. That's what it really means in the original Hebrew. Anyway, so Paul's already in a bad spot, but on top of it, he's boasting just like Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar is given a punishment that is is not sinful by God. It's not evil. It's a way to uh, deal with him, and that drove him mad. Okay, and that God, God made him mad, and God says what in uh, uh, Isaiah forty four. I frustrate the signs of the liars and I make the diviners mad. I turn the wise men backwards, basically into basically not having their special knowledge, and I make their knowledge foolish. Now, now let's go and take a look at Paul for a minute. I'm going to show you the passage when I, well, okay, one more thing. Paul actually has a blasphemy that is in the New Testament, so I advise everybody to be careful of this passage. Never repeat it, never teach it. It says, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That is blasphemy 101. That is saying God sends uh, false <laughs> false uh, 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 delusions, basically false facts to try to lead you to salvation, to damnation. That's not what God does. He doesn't send you a strong delusion that you have to resist from God. That's what Satan does. God is giving you powerful uh, information and, and encouragement in his word and and his power in supernaturally to help you. He doesn't send strong delusion. This is a flat out blasphemy of God, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10 to 13. Now, if you say, Doug, no, it isn't. It's not blasphemy. Well, 
take a look at this very commonsensical article by the Christian intelligencer, intelligencer and this is a academic theologian type argument or article. It says things hard to understand illustrated 1821. And what they say is if the damned are believing, if they are damned for believing a lie and believe the lie because God sent the delusion and sufficiently strong to produce its effects. And what character does it present the God of truth and love at 59? And they go on to say it's a blasphemy. But then they try to say, well, maybe we can rewrite this, but it, it's not rewritable. They have a they said, just let's just throw a word in there to screw it up. So it doesn't sound the bad as it is. It is. It's no there's nothing that you can retranslate it. But that's what they're suggesting. Let's put in another word to make it more vague. So people actually what I think he was doing is trying to protect the reader from blasphemy and the pastors from repeating this, which is all blasphemy. So they would all go to hell. Who's ever taught this in a sermon is unfortunately going to hell unpardonably because it's a blasphemy of God. So this is the kind of person God's dealing with. Would you think God might make this Paul go mad because he's because of his uh, actions? And it's not just his actions after he's a Christian. He did a horrible bunch of stuff before he claimed to become a Christian. Now I'm going to show you the clearest example that Paul was had gone mad. And, and it's not, a lot of people just read 2 Corinthians 11, 16 to 23, and then they don't read 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 6. You got to put both together. So it's just the next few verses later. And let's read it together. I'm going to read it slowly and calmly and listen to what he's saying. I say again, let, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool, receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That's self-contradictory stuff. That's kind of already a little over the edge, isn't it? Verse 17, that which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. And what is he telling you? I can't say this in, is from the Lord, but I'm going to do it anyway, even though it's foolish. And I'm boasting. I'm going to do it in my confidence of boasting. He literally is saying, I'm not going to resist my sinful nature. The very thing that Nebuchadnezzar was punished in Daniel 4, I'm going to do exactly what he did. And I'm going to hope you just tolerate me doing it. Verse 18, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. What is he saying? Paul's saying, since other people glory, I'm going to glory. So it, the, the standard of behavior, what you could do or not do, is depending on what other people do. If they do wrong, I can do wrong. That's that's such, what illogic. A crazy person would say that, not a religiously motivated person who's found Christ and is following and obeying Jesus Christ. This is a person who's lost it, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go to verse 19. For you suffer fools gladly, seeing you yourselves are wise. He's mocking them and he's saying you, you're, you're wise, so you accept fools. So you got to accept me because you accept other fools. I mean, he's then calling himself a fool again. I mean, that's not, a again, a, would Jesus ever talk this way? Give me a break if you think so. Verse 20, for you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, meaning if you follow his logic in the, all these epistles, it means brings you into bondage to God's law, by, uh, which is given by angels through a mediator and uh, the, by the weak and beggarly celestial beings. That's in Galatians 3.19 and 4.9. 4 verse 9 if a man devour you if a man take of you if a man exalt himself if a man smite you on the face so you tolerate all these things he's saying but so you're going to have to tolerate me being a crazy person and boasting uh, as a fool and i and i'm not saying i'm speaking for the lord i'm definitely not speaking for the lord that's what he's saying can you can you gra gather he's lost it my friends then he says verse 20 and 10, 21 i speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak how be, how be it wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. So if anybody else is bold, I'm bold too. <laughs> I mean, what kind, was this a contest of who's bold and not bold? I mean, that again is a, not just foolishness, but immaturity. Next, verse 22, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. <laughs> In labors more abundant, in stripes more measure, above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths off. He's literally saying, I don't care about the 12 apostles. I'm better than them. <laughs> I've been suffered more than they've ever suffered. How does he know that? And you killed and murdered people who are Christians. I would say they've suffered a hell of a lot more than you have ever suffered up to that point, Paul. 
What about the people you killed and murdered? Steve and the, the, the martyr in Acts, uh, I think it's seven. You were there standing while people were murdering him and you did nothing to stop them. And it was a, it was a crime and you actually were helping. So what, what are you talking about? Have you suffered more than Stephen? And you were standing there and you could have helped prevent his death, but you didn't. You're a murderer and you admit it. Now, it gets worse. Got to go to 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 9. And you have to know this passage begins where Paul is acting like I'm, I'm being super humble by telling you about a guy in the third heaven and he he by the time you get to verse six you realize it's him well just tell us but he's playing this off that you, you know you know i'm trying to be so humble and so restrictive i'm not actually going to come out and tell you so cl clearly until i get a few verses down so let's read chapter 12 for second corinthians verse one it is not expedient for me doubtless to glory so you say it's not the the benefits do not outweigh the costs of me glorying. So he knows that glorying is a bad thing and you're going to treat it as negative. So why are you doing this? But he says, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. So now he's, for whatever reason, he's changing gears. And now he's going to talk about visions and revelations. So that's how he introduces it. Verse two, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Such a one caught, was caught up to the third heaven. Three, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows. Verse four, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for man to utter. Verse five, of such a one will I glory. Now he's telling you it's himself. Well, of that person, I'm gonna glory. I'm gonna boast a little bit. Yet of myself, I will not glory. So he's gonna boast of this man who he's, he's trying to make it sound like it's himself, but he's saying it's he's he's almost dis, dis, distancing himself from this man who, who is himself, and and that's how he's going to be humble. I'm telling you all the great things this guy's experienced in the revelations, but uh, you know, for myself, I'm not glorying. But for that man who was brought up into heaven, third heaven, I'm glorying for him. So <laughs> it's confusing, but it's but everybody agrees. But I'm going to glory. He says, yet of myself, I will not glory, but in my infirmities. So now he says, I will glory in my infirmities, my su my sufferings, my weaknesses, right? And he's going to actually say that next. Verse six, for though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. So now he's going to be not a fool, be use more common sense. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he sees me to be, or that he that hears me but it is an over, ladies and gentlemen. And lest I should be exalted, verse seven, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Aha. So now he's completely revealed who that man was that he wasn't going to boast about. He said that was like this different guy and I'm me, but now he's boasting of those revelations that man had in third heaven. This is how the scholars all agree. This is Paul uh, uh, revealing finally that he is that person he was talking about previously. Then he explains this. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, and that's actually Angelos Satanas, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So he's given an angel of Satan, uh, is using this thorn in his flesh to, to buffet me, to, to uh, torment him is actually what it says in Greek. Lest I should be exalted above measure. So that he's saying is, this has been given to him, this angel of Satan, obviously he's implying God gave it to him, so that he would not be boastful, exalted above measure. So just keep him humble of having these experiences in the third heaven. For this thing I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And it's, in, if you translate it correctly, it's leave me, that he prayed three times it would leave him. So he was asking his Lord, that means Jesus probably, to please take this tormenting angel of Satan out of my flesh and take it away from me. And this is what his Lord Jesus said, verse nine. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Then Paul, that's it. So all he gets is, is that ruling. That's all Jesus, his Jesus says. Then Paul says, most gladly, therefore, therefore will I rather, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And 
the power of this guy's mind was lost on him. He, 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 he wasn't computing this right. Jesus is going to collaborate with an angel of Satan who's tormenting you in your flesh. And his purpose is that the angel of Satan is going to cooperate in this project of keeping you humble by virtue of this torment. If Paul were truly a servant of Christ, that Jesus wanted to be a good servant, he would do something completely different than put, keeping him subject to an angel of Satan. He Because that angel of Satan isn't actually there to help Paul be a better minister. How could Jesus be using an enemy of Christ? As his, I mean, if, so it's Paul didn't to put, to put two and two together. This Jesus, you keep seeing in visions uh, since the angel, since he was in the temple in Acts 22. He said, his Jesus said, run out of Jerusalem. Don't go see the apostles. They won't believe you met me. That's the that's the second time Jesus talked to him. Now here's the third time that we know of. And if clear, clearly this is can't be the real Jesus, the real Jesus would have cast out the demon. So Paul's mental capacity, his mind really is so low. Remember, God said in in Isaiah 44 that he's going to drive, he's going to make them mad, make them mad. He's going to deprive them of their normal intelligence, knowledge. That's in the second one, the, the wise people. And uh, so he that's what, how can Paul not compute? This is not the real Jesus. The real Jesus couldn't possibly leave you under a demon and would never collaborate with a demon, an angel of Satan, no less, a, a top dog next to Satan himself. Why, why would Jesus, why, why would the, the demon or the angel of Satan cooperate with Jesus? Why would Jesus collaborate with a de, uh, the angel of Satan to keep you humble? It doesn't make sense. And then the next thing you do is you boast about it. I'm going to glory in my infirmities, in my weaknesses that Jesus is, said, that, you're saying that Jesus told you, I'm giving you this, I'm going to let this torment continue from an angel of Satan because that's going to keep you humble. And the next thing you do is you boast about your infirmities. The word their glory, by the way, should be translated directly in other Bibles. It's boast. I'm going to boast about my infirmities. I'm going to boast about my weaknesses. He just doesn't get it. He never changes. He's a he's a Nebuchadnezzar on steroids. And his mind has already been lost because Nebuchadnezzar hadn't yet, yet gotten to the point where he was eating grass, that he not yet had suffered the affliction. But Paul already has suffered the affliction from God, which God does do this to certain people. And this clearly is crazy talk C crazy from step one i want you to go back so if you, you tell me if, he's saying in second corinthians eleven sixteen, let me know and think me think me a fool yet as a fool receive me that i may boast a little and then he goes on and says i'm speaking not as the lord i'm speaking foolishly in this confidence of boasting in verse 17 i mean it's just it just doesn't have any, he's cra he's gone crazy. This is a madman at this point in time. And I don't mean that to insult him, to make you feel you shouldn't like him. I mean, literally, that's a, this is a mad person. He is literally tormented by an angel of uh, Satan, and he's gone crazy that he cannot process and conclude correctly that this cannot be the Lord Jesus. You've got to p use your head. And what did God say? What did God say is going to happen to people like Paul? I'm going to drive, I'm going to make the diviners mad. I'm going to turn the wise men backward and I'm going to make their knowledge foolish. So Paul wasn't just speaking as a fool. God had made him a fool at that point. And a fool would believe this is the Lord Jesus. Only a fool. You'll say, oh, but centuries of Christians have believed it was from the real Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, the real Jesus Christ, no, we know his character. Any person that asked them to cause a demon, an angel of Satan, for, for of all things in this case, to leave somebody, he would always answer it positively and do that pr the prayer request I asked if it was sincere, obviously. So I, I just it's just mind-boggling. Okay, but we're going to have an episode two on this. So that's just right off the bat. We have proof positive that Paul had gone mad. And there's a lot of more, uh, more examples. And so this is going to be a series. And so I'm going to show you, though, the Jewish perception of Paul in the next episode. Uh, episode in episode two. And you're going to see the Jewish people have often noticed a lot of other examples and proof that Paul had had become a mad person. He, he was literally crazy or insane in some way that he had a apoplexy of the brain or paradox. They have all kinds of words for it. They try to be polite. I'm just saying bluntly what they're saying is he, he became a madman and crazy. And uh, well, you know what? I'm going to play one. I'm going to show you one. I'm going to show you one. This is uh, Eisenman because this is short. 
And uh, some others note, this is uh, I'm in my introduction, some others note that this can be viewed as a mad hatred of others. And I, I had been talking about Paul's hatred before that of uh, people. Is there an unbalanced savagery latent in his tongue? Paul writes, quote, I wish they would cut themselves off with of off who are unsettling you. And that means these are people who wanted uh, Gentiles to be circumcised to go to the temple or if they wanted to go visit a, 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 Jew, a Jewish person in their home on Passover. Those are the t- situations you have to be circumcised. And he's saying anybody who's trying to get you to be circumcised are people who should have their own organ completely cut off. That's what it says. So it's a really modified pa- passage there. So it's not can maybe pass uh, regulatory uh, review here. Galatians 5, verse 12. And based on that, Professor Eisman describes Paul's words at numerous points in Galatians as, a, as that which, quote, an objective observer might be forgiven for thinking this man is not only imbalanced, but actually mad. Eisenman, New Testament Code, 2006 at 580. And he's not a theologian. He's just simply telling you what common sense would dictate. All right. So we're going to come back. We're going to get more Jewish uh, opinions that uh, deal with the issue. Is Paul, did Paul become a man? And did he become uh, and they they basically also attribute it to some sort of epilepsy that a lot of what he's saying for, he falls into trances at the temple and a prayer to time and and his speaking in tongues and all these things and he Paul spoke in a, not the kind of tongues that the apostles had in, in Acts chapter one he had a different tongues it was a glossalia that nobody can understand without an interpreter and that's not the gift of the tongues at all in Acts 1, where that's where anybody who was an apostle speaking in one language and all the people from different countries could hear it in their own dialect. So if you were from Rome, you'd hear it in Latin, even though the apostles are speaking Hebrew. And if you were from Persia, you'd hear it in Persian, even though the apostles speaking Hebrew. So that's the true gift of tongues. Paul had this weird other kind of gift of tongues. So the Jewish people have picked up on all these things and they can help us and guide us. Are we looking and listening at a person who went mad? All right, everybody, God bless. Take care. Ciao. Bye.